For session two, we're going to have um, Bethany Lush um, speak about um, sort of introduce neural networks to all of us. Um, she's uh, an assistant computer scientist here at Argonne um, as part of the uh, data science team at the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. Um, and I will hand it off to her and let her introduce herself a little bit. Thank you. Um, my background is in applied math. And so I'm excited to tell you about some of the mathematics behind uh, deep learning. Now, this whole series is about artificial intelligence, which is a little hard to define, but roughly it's a, a set of approaches to solving complex problems by imitating how the, that the brain can learn. And machine learning is arguably now a subfield of AI. So that's also hard to define, but we could say something like it's the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So Huiho talked about this last week. Um, instead of us writing down a bunch of rules for the computer to follow, the machine learning algorithm can learn patterns from the data. And today, we're going to talk about neural networks, which is a technique within machine learning. So there's AI, there's machine learning as a subfield within AI, and then there's neural networks as a technique within machine learning. Um, and neural networks tends to perform well when you have lots of data. And when you use a neural network that's big, it has a lot of layers, people say deep learning, so I might interchangeably say neural networks and deep learning, even if our network is not deep. So that's a little bit of vocabulary for today. And today I'm going to introduce the fundamental concepts and background. Uh, next week, Corey is going to teach you about more advanced neural networks. And then um, in the following weeks, we'll talk more about the kinds of neural networks used for large language models. But today is a foundation for those future weeks. Uh, and we're building on last week. So last week, we did linear regression to predict the sale price of a house. The input to this very simple model or function was uh, the above ground square foot, square feet of a house. And the output that we wanna predict is the sale price. We're fitting just a linear function and we're minimizing the error. In the context of machine learning, we kind of more generally call this a loss function. Last week, we used mean squared error. And the algorithm we used to fit the function to the data was stochastic gradient descent. So we're going to build on all of that this week. But we're working on what's called a classification problem, which means that instead of outputting real numbers, we want to output category labels. So we we have a bunch of input output pairs. This time this week the inputs are going to be images of handwritten numbers and the outputs are going to be the uh, the category which is the digit shown in the image and we want to learn a function to fit that mapping. And uh, in this diagram here you can see how we can transform an image into something mathematical. Uh, we have a, a matrix representing the image. This one's grayscale. So uh, each number in the matrix is from zero to one, how dark it is. And the function that we're going to fit to map from images to labels is has a specific form called a neural network. And today I'm going to talk about fitting functions. And I'm thinking in terms of linear algebra and calculus, but later in this series, we'll talk about um, probabilistic models where you're thinking more like the machine learning method is learning some probability distribution. But for today, in, in this context, we're thinking about fitting functions. So uh, here's a link to our notebook for today. Now, if you're all set up with an ALCF account, then you can um, use that today. If not, or you're having some kind of trouble with ALCF, you can also use Google Colab, because this isn't a very big problem this week. So um, as a refresher for how to get going, 
um, here's how you um, SSH into Polaris. And you'll want to pull down my updates to the repo. Um, if you don't remember how to sync your fork, there's a link here to the instructions. And then um, in the notebook, we're downloading data from the internet. And when you use Jupyter Hub for Polaris, it runs on a node that doesn't have internet access by default. So we need to um, have these extra settings. So one option is you can um, edit this file from your terminal and copy in these lines. Um, or you can set these as environment variables in your notebook um, if someone else wants to put that in the Slack, then that's the other option. OK, so then um, once you've cloned, not cloned, um, pulled the updates from my repo, we're ready to run them. Um, and if you don't remember how to run on Jupyter Hub or Google Colab, here's a link to the steps. And this is just a reminder that you have to pick the kernel. Although um, I see now that's very obvious in the Jupyter Hub right in front of you to pick a kernel. Um, so I'm going to do Jupyter Hub. And um, I already requested a node. So if anyone is having problems with that, please ask in the Slack channel. Um, and remember, there is a reminder of the steps here. So I have a Polaris node assigned to me. And uh, this uh, Jupyter service is running on it. And here I could is my how I can navigate my directory. So home folder and then the AI science training series. This is where I cloned the repo. And then I've moved into folder two. And um, I double clicked on this notebook to open it up. And um, it asked me which kernel I wanted, and this one is a reasonable one. OK, so I mentioned before that today we're going to talk about the MNIST problem. This is this data set is um, actually a real success story of machine learning uh, from decades ago, which is that the post office wants to have machines to automatically sort our mail by zip code. So it wants to be able to read our handwritten numbers. And I mentioned before that the input is an image of one hander and digit, and the output is we want to label which digit it is. And we're going to use PyTorch for this, which is a very popular Python library. So here we're importing it. And um, MNIST is so popular that we can download it directly from the PyTorch library. So there's these convenient functions here for that. The, uh, uh, let's see. This was really fast for me. It might take like a minute for you if you haven't done it yet. Because um, I've already downloaded it to my home directory by running this notebook before. Um, these data sets have those inputs, which are the images. We can call that X for the input, and we call the outputs Y often which were those labels, the digits zero through nine. And this data set comes already split for us in what we call a training data set and a test data set. The training data is what we use for that optimization problem of fitting the function to the data. And the test data is what you save for the end of your project to see how well your data generalizes to new, see how well your model generalizes to new data um, it hasn't seen before. And MNIST comes with 60,000 examples of handwritten numbers for training and 10,000 for test. Each input image is 1 by 28 by 28 pixels. The 1 is because it's grayscale. Um, if we were doing color images, there would be a 3 there for uh, RGB. 
And then the output labels are just an integer, which digit the image represents. And then I'm splitting the data again. I'm splitting the training data into training and validation. That's because it's convenient to have another data set that you can use to compare your models and see how well they are generalizing like tentatively. So I wanna only train on a smaller amount. Here I picked this 80%, uh, 20% split. So I'm going to fit the function with only 48,000 examples, set aside 12,000, which I can use to compare some options. And then the 10,000 test examples are saved till the very end. And it's always good to take a look at your data to have some idea of what you're working with. So this cell plots for us the first 10 examples and uh, their labels. So that makes sense. We can see that some of these are a little tricky, like this zeros, pretty bad. And then PyTorch has these data loaders, which we wrap around our data and makes the data set iterable. And we talked last week about batch size. So when we, we can iterate over the data set and look at just 128 examples at a time. And of course you can uh, change this value. Now we need to decide what kind of model or function we want to fit to the data. And we're going to use the functional format of neural networks. And we need some loss function to minimize to see, um, to measure how good the model is. And then we have to decide how to optimize it. And we're going to start with just a linear model like last week. Although our data is higher dimensional, so it's a little different. For today, we're going to flatten each image into a vector. And so the, uh, the input is just a vector. And instead of multiplying by what we would think of as a slope, um, now we're multiplying by a whole vector. So it becomes a dot product. So it's like a linear combination of all those pixels uh, weighted by what these uh, parameters are that we're learning. And then if the output is also a vector, this becomes matrix multiplication. And this is how people tend to draw neural networks. So this first column of green here is the size of your input, which in our case is pixels. And then the, this other column is the size of the output. And people draw all these edges, which you can think of as this part of the output is dependent on all of these inputs because it has edges all the way. You can think of it as a linear combination of all the inputs and the way the weights of the linear combination are defined by this matrix we're learning. Um, or you can think of it as to go from here to here, we're multiplying by one big matrix. And today we're talking about um, neural networks where all of the layer, the whole layer is connected to the whole previous layer. So this is called um, fully connected or a dense layer. And uh, next week you'll learn about other types of layers that are not fully connected. So you can also think of this as this linear layer. You've got your input X, you're multiplying by a matrix W. And really we're usually also adding a vector B, which is called a bias. So people don't draw that into the picture. And we wouldn't expect just this to work very well on images, especially because we want to output just a class label zero through nine. We just want integers to come out. And if we just showed it a bunch of examples and then did mean squared error, we'd probably get a bunch of decimals at like 3.55. So there's two tricks we're going to do here to make it a little more reasonable. One is we're going to make the output a vector of 10 instead of just the one digit. And these are the class probabilities. So there's 10 possible classes, the digits zero through nine. And the output of this function is going to be um, 
the probability that this image is in each of the classes. So it should output something where each item in the vector is from zero to one and adds up to one. And instead of minimizing mean squared error, we're going to minimize cross entropy. Now buried in this loss function is this thing called softmax, which roughly says of these 10 probabilities, which one is the highest? And that's the label we're gonna give. And then this entropy part has to do with probabilities. And you can read more about it at this link. Um, just checking if I'm surrounding any cells. Okay, so here is how we can define this simple neural network in PyTorch that we've been talking about. First, this layer is going to flatten the image. So instead of um, a square of 28 by 28 pixels, each image is 784 long. And uh, next week, Corey will talk about other kinds of layers that let us keep the image as a square. And then we're just going to have one linear layer, like we had in the picture. The input is the 784 pixels, and the output is a vector of length 10, which is the probability that this, the probability for each class for this image. So hopefully if the digit really is a five, then the fifth entry is the highest. So we define these layers and then in this forward function is um, just saying, okay, when you input your data, you should apply these two layers. And I mentioned that we're gonna use cross entropy as our loss function uh, because it's a classification problem. This is very typical for classification. And then uh, like last week, we're gonna use basic stochastic gradient descent. So here it is built into PyTorch. There are more advanced variants of stochastic gradient descent, like the atom optimizer or RMS prop and so forth. And you can learn about them with these links. And there's some cool animations to give you some intuition about how they improve upon gradient descent. But for now, we'll do stochastic gradient descent. And last week, we learned about the learning rate for uh, gradient descent which is how far you're stepping in the direction of the gradient. So um, here I picked a, an arbitrary learning rate. You can try changing it later. Some typical options are um, numbers like 0.01 or um, add another zero in there. Some people try um, intervals of multiplying by three. Roughly the order of magnitude matters more than um, changing it by a tiny bit. Okay, so now we've set up some pieces for training. Let me check the chat. Okay, so Paul asked uh, why we would choose this optimizer for this problem. Um, so stochastic gradient descent is um, fairly basic. I think, I guess it's uh, computationally efficient. Normally I wouldn't pick just stochastic gradient descent. A lot of people start with something like Atom Optimizer. Um, I think there's a lot of people studying the theory, but a lot of times people also just try a few. Um, okay, when we're ready to train, this is adding some vocabulary to what um, or reinforcing some vocabulary from what Huiho said last week. Uh, in each step of the training, we're going to do what's called a forward pass, which is that you pass your input through the network, like the current state of that function you're training. And then what's called the backward pass is that we need to compute the gradient of the loss function, in this case, cross entropy. And that if you've done calculus, you you know, these, you're familiar with these partial derivatives. The gradient is with respect to all those parameters in the network that we can optimize. And specifically the way we calculate this gradient in a reasonably uh, efficient way 
Well, we need to do a bunch of chain, chain rule once we get a lot of layers. And um, the way this is done without doing a lot of repeat calculation is to move backwards. And it's called back propagation. So we're not going to go into the details of back propagation, but that's it, it's uh, uh, built into PyTorch. And the idea is calculate those gradients uh, with the chain rule and be uh, reasonably efficient by moving backwards. Okay, so now we have the gradient. And so we know how to update the weights. And the way we update it is moving in the direction of the gradient multiplied by the learning rate, which is how far to go in that direction. So this looks like what we did last week. And um, like we talked about last week, there's this idea of a batch size, which is how many examples to consider in each step. And um, smaller batch size would mean that for each step, you're only considering uh, a few examples at a time. And then when you loop over the data, each step might be kind of noisy because it, it might go like this way because, oh, these few examples wanted to go this way. And then the next step goes this way because those few examples wanted to go that way. On a larger batch size, every time you calculate the gradient, you're averaging over more data. So the gradient might be um, sort of more accurate, but you're kind of averaging across a lot of examples. So maybe you're losing some information. And having a higher batch size requires more memory. And then as a piece of vocabulary, an epoch means passing through the training data once. So I have this definition here, train one epoch. Uh, and we're looping over all the batches. And this data loader we defined before, and it conveniently knows what batch size we wanted. Here's that forward pass. We pass that input from the batch into the model as it is defined so far, the current set of parameters. Then we calculate the loss at this point. And then the backward pass calculates the gradients for this current loss. Then we take one step uh, in the direction of the gradient. And then this just resets the gradients. And then um, oh, this function is helpful for tracking the status as we go along. So I'll come back to this. Um, this cell will take a couple of minutes maybe. This is where we're doing the whole training. We're looping over the epochs. I wasn't very patient, so I only put five for now. Each time we're calling this function that loops over all the batches, then we're checking the training loss and accuracy. You could check it more often, but um, I'm going with checking it once per epoch to print our progress. And so here's that function for um, checking the status. It's, um, we, we put the model in evaluation mode because some layers do some different things during training. This just says, oh, don't bother calculating gradients right now because we don't need them. And then loop over the batches, stick the batch in the model to get a prediction, check what the loss is. And then for classification, uh, cross entropy isn't very intuitive. So I'm also tracking accuracy, which is just the percentage of examples that are correctly labeled. So this line is calculating how many examples were correct. We're gonna average and output this. So in my five epochs, the loss is going down, which is what we expect. That means we're successfully minimizing it, um, but I don't have intuition for what 0.501 means. So I'm also printing accuracy and it's going up from 83% to 88%, uh, just in this uh, 30 seconds. And then it can be helpful to look at your data and get an idea of what's going wrong um, and troubleshoot. Here I just display the first 10 examples 
and see what it's labeling them as. And this batch is, the model is surprisingly quite accurate. It got all of these right. Um, but we know overall it's about 88% accurate. And so I'm going to pause for a 10 minute break. The exercise is um, you can experiment with these last few cells to see how you can improve the model. Um, see if you can get higher than 88%. Some things you could do is uh, increase the number of epochs because this was only 30 seconds of training. Looks like it could do better if I just kept going. Um, you could change the learning rate, um, things like that. So um, I'll see you back in 10 minutes and we can discuss um, what was successful and what was not successful. After the break, we'll talk about doing a um, more complicated network. Um, welcome back. Did some people successfully train this network to be more accurate? Uh, if so, I'm interested in hearing what you tried uh, in Slack or the Zoom chat. And if you're stuck and aren't able to run, then it'd be great to put that in Slack so we can troubleshoot what people are stuck on. Oh, I see um, Prashant talking about trying some options, including one that got 90% validation accuracy. Orlando is talking about using the Atom Optimizer. Check Slack. Uh, Alex reached 91.6%, um, changing the number of epochs and batch size. Also about 92%. Um, it's possible to get about 99, more than 99% accurate on this model, but we're uh, doing a linear, I mean, sorry, it's possible to get more than 99% accurate on this data set with a neural network, but we're doing uh, a linear model. So that's greatly, um, limiting how accurate you can get. Sounds like the highest that people have reached is 92%. Um, it's pretty impressive that it's even possible to get 92% um, with a linear model. When I tried before where the output was just one number, the class and do mean squared error, I was stuck way lower, but having um, the output be the length of 10 uh, with the class probabilities and then the cross entropy loss helps a lot. Um, which makes sense because the, the cross entropy loss sort of built into it is doing um, this the soft max piece that's roughly picking the maximum of all those probabilities. Okay, and um, is anyone having trouble running at all? I know people have put um, some issues in Slack. If you have any other issues that haven't been mentioned in Slack, um, please put them there. Are people able to reach that Conda module that I picked in Jupyter Hub? Or is it not an option for you? All right. Um, I'm going to show you how to do uh, a more advanced network. And if you're continuing to have trouble running, my coworkers can hopefully resolve that in Slack. But I'm glad that at least some of you were able to run an experiment and get up to 92% accurate, which is great. So I um, oh, need to share again.
Okay. So back in my Jupyter Hub notebook, scrolling down. So um, up here, we were tracking the training data loss, but it's also good to check how your model is doing on the validation data. And I'm sorry, before the break, I accidentally used the words underfitting and overfitting without defining them. So let's um, skip down to a picture I have about that. If a neural network is too simple, so uh, here, here's an example from polynom fitting a polynomial. The data is uh, these blue points. And the, the real function that generated this data are the, is the orange curve. And let's say you're fitting just a line to this data, which is um, this blue line. Then that is too simple of a model to capture what's really happening with this data. And that's called underfitting. And then on the far right here, if we fit this data with a degree 15 polynomial, it does this crazy curving around and it, it hits, it goes through a lot of those points. So it would, the mean squared error would be very low, but um, this is considered overfitting. It's getting too close to those samples and doing crazy complicated things in between the samples in order to hit them so closely. So it's not gonna generalize very well to other points. And then what's more balanced is the middle, which is if you pick a degree four polynomial and um, it doesn't as perfectly go through as many of the points, but it's going in between them and it's uh, better capturing the general trend. So these pictures are from fitting polynomials to your data, but the exact same thing happens when the function that you're fitting is a neural network. If your data is too complicated for how simple the model is, then you might be an underfitting. So since we're doing fitting a linear model to these images, we're kind of stuck in this underfitting part on the left. And um, as you guys try for more epochs and improve some hyperparameters, maybe this line got better, but it's still a line fitting something more complicated. I'm going to show you how to do a more complicated network, and you might get into this case over here of overfitting. And if you were just looking at the error on the data, these samples here, which we would call training data in the context of machine learning, it's hard to tell that you're overfitting. Just like, oh, that error is great. So that's why it's good to hold out some data and check how you're doing. We're going to call that validation data because Validation, let's say we trained these three models uh, on your data set, and you don't know, you can check the training error, but you don't know which one's going to generalize the best. You could then apply those three models to your validation data and see um, which one's the lowest, giving you some idea of generalization ability. Um, okay, so right here, Oh, I see the question, what's the difference between validation and test set? So um, the validation data you can use to compare your models and pick the best model, or things like deciding when to stop training, uh, which is sort of like comparing models because you're comparing the state of the model at epoch, let's say 10 versus epoch 11. And um, so, so the validation data, there's lower risk that you um, too closely fit the quirks of the validation data because you're not using it directly in the optimizer, but it's still possible if you experimented for a really long time to even overfit the validation data. So the test data we're supposed to hold out till the, when you have a model you're happy with and you want to like publish about it or use it at your company or something like that. So the training data, is what you use for the optimization problem, the actual like iterative fitting. The validation data is to compare models, trained models, and the test data is for the very end to get um, a more reliable estimate of your 
generalization. Okay, now before the break, we did this cell here, which showed the first 10 examples. And the model was actually right on these 10. At least in my notebook, there's a lot of randomization. So this cell is instead going to look for 10 failure cases. So we can get a better idea of how good this model is. So um, here, the first number is the predicted class, and the number in parentheses is the true class. And some of these might kind of make sense, like this nine got labeled a four. You can kind of see how that mistake could happen. But most of them are not very intuitive mistakes. Um, maybe this three got confused because it kind of looks like an unfinished eight. Uh, so this kind of checking in to see what's going on with your model um, can help, especially if you're making a bigger change, like um, changing the kind of layers to be layers that make sense for your data or something like that. So um, this network is making mistakes that seem silly to us, but it's not too surprising because the model is linear. To make a neural network more accurate, we often need more layers and we need nonlinearities. So here's a diagram of a neural network with an extra layer in it. We call this first one here the input layer and the last one the output layer. And any in-between ones we call the hidden layer. And uh, here's the math going on here. So before we just had this first part, which was you multiply by, you got the input x, multiply by a matrix, add a vector. Now we can add nonlinearities, which is um, often written as a sigma. And those are called activation functions. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And then we can uh, compose this over and over. So the next layer is multiply by another matrix, add another vector, and apply another nonlinearity. And you could just keep doing this. You could have a really deep network, which um, we have a picture of down here, uh, where you keep adding more layers. But it's the same kind of functional form that each layer, you're multiplying by a matrix, adding a vector, and applying a nonlinearity. Now, this, um, if we didn't have the nonlinearity we were, and we added a lot of layers, then it's, well, you're still just multiplying by matrices and adding vectors. So they just kind of stack up and it doesn't help you be more complicated. But the nonlinearity makes it possible to match more complicated data. And here's some examples of potential activation functions. Now, this one in the middle, sigmoid, uh, was very common before. It forces the output to be from 0 to 1. And it's uh, differentiable, which is good for we have that back propagation step that is calculating all the gradients. Uh, so not being differentiable is kind of can be concerning. Now this one ReLU is super popular. It all the negatives get set to zero and the positives just pass through as the identity. It is non-differentiable though, which depending on your application could be a problem. Um, and some of these look kind of similar to ReLU, but are smoother like this LU so that you have differentiability. And um, this is admittedly not very intuitive, but the sigmoid, um, we could go in the direction of talking about these neurons being very, very loosely inspired by biological neurons and um, how information is processed there and handle insects. So we have this deeper, we can have a deeper network. Um, all in, today we're only talking about fully connected layers, 
So all that's happening is multiply by matrix, add a vector, apply a nonlinearity, do that repeatedly. Um, and I talked about that if you make it too complicated, you could overfit. You have a low training error, but um, higher validation in a test error. Oops. So um, one thing you can do is keep your model, the neural network, still big, but add techniques called regularization, which constrains it to discourage complicated models. And there is different approaches I'll mention too. One is dropout. And uh, I'll show you how to do that in code here. In dropout, you it ran, during training, will randomly set some of the neurons to zero at some frequency that you picked. And it'll keep changing which ones it sets to zero. This makes the neural network more robust because uh, it somehow manages to be accurate despite pieces of it being randomly set to zero. And um, so this can help make the prevent overfitting. Uh, now my one hour of my notebook passed, but that's okay. Um, another option is you add a term. This one is called L2 regularization. And you have this lambda that is how strong you want to add this. This is, if you're familiar, it's the L2 norm of your weights. OK, I'll restart my notebook. Um, but if you're not familiar, you can think of it as roughly measuring how big those weights are. So your loss term becomes your original loss term, which is roughly an error that you're minimizing, plus this other piece um, that is roughly how big your weights are. Now you're balancing error versus um, complexity because roughly if these weights are big, your model is complicated, which I kind of, I kind of picture as it's allowed to swing around crazily. So here I'm okay, I'm gonna switch tabs because I don't have the connection anymore, but I don't need it to show you this function. Okay, so here I uh, defined a nonlinear model. It's similar to the linear model further up. We're still gonna flatten the data, um, but I added some more layers. The linear layers are followed by this ReLU activation function. Uh, I think of it as that fully connected layer. Um, itself is will apply the the ReLU activation function but the way PyTorch words it is sort of two different lines but you can think of it as all um, one layer it's going to do that um, multiply by the matrix add a vector with this line and then this line is um, apply that nonlinearity and then here we're doing another layer a linear layer followed by ReLU and then a final one I commented out the dropout layers, but you can try them out. That's what we mentioned here about randomly setting pieces to zero. And um, the forward pass is still flattened and then apply all the layers. And then your homework is to uh, write some code to train this model. So you wanna adapt the code from further up the notebook to train this model instead of the other model and create a data loader for the test data. Because back up here, I downloaded the test data, but I didn't put a data loader around it because we don't want to use the test data until the end. So you can uh, create your test data loader and check the test loss and accuracy. Um, 
And if you have time, you can experiment with how to improve this model. Um, I mentioned before that it's possible to get over 99% accuracy. And we can talk a little bit more about what's going on here so that you have some ideas of what you might want to change. So the first layer, the input is still 28 by 28 because that's the size of the images, 28 pixels by 28. Now this 50 I picked is pretty arbitrary. That's the width of this first hidden layer. So it's like how many green circles there are. And you can also think of that as that first layer is multiplying by a matrix that's um, 28 times 28, whatever, whatever number that was, 784 or something, by uh, 50. Um, then ReLU, ReLU is a reasonable activation function to try, but you could change it. Then my next layer, I sort of arbitrarily kept it the same width. So that's like in this picture where the next layer is just 50 again. So that means this matrix here is multiplying by a 50 by 50 matrix. And ReLU. And then this last layer, the first part's 50 because it has to match here. Um, but it's important that the output was 10 because that's the number of classes and we're doing the probability of each class. Um, note that I did not I did not do another um, nonlinearity at the end. You could, depends on your data. So I, ex I want the output of my network to be a vector of 10 where each number is between zero and one, and they add up to one because they're supposed to be probabilities. So ReLU wouldn't hurt here because that um, ReLU uh, zeroes out all the negative numbers. And that's okay for this network because um, we don't need negative numbers to come out of our network anyway. But if you had a different data set where you want to predict negative numbers, it would be very bad that if your last layer was ReLU, so you just can't predict any negative numbers. Okay, so I want to um, pause to check on Slack and see if people have questions. And then um, Paige, do we switch to the our guest speaker in about five minutes? Is that right? Yep. Yeah, we're just waiting for her to to hop on. So we still have a little bit of time to potentially answer, potentially answer any questions. Oh, I see the question in Zoom. Shouldn't we apply softmax to the final layer? It depends on the exact definition of the loss. So um, the, the way PyTorch defined cross entropy, I don't need softmax because that's like in the loss function. Um, but if I use a different variant, then I would end with softmax. OK, someone asked. How do you choose um, different layers? So um, roughly having more layers and um, wider layers lets the function be more complicated. And so that, that could be good because uh, then you can more accurately fit your complicated data. But if it's excessive, then you could easily overfit. Or maybe you're just using more computation than necessary. Um, one approach is just make it big. It might be excessively big, but then do these regularization techniques to compensate. Um, I see the question is building a model still more of an art than a science. Um, I haven't, I don't see what the, um, okay, I'm quickly skimming what people have replied. It looks like you've already got some answers. Um, I think they're some of each. People are definitely trying to study this because it's um, 
people don't like just fiddling around with options randomly and seeing what happens. So there's um, some theory to back up choices and some uh, studies of what's been effective for other people that can be helpful. To some extent, there's some arbitrariness when people try things. Um, and um, it can, sometimes it helps if you think about your problem. So for example, let's say um, your neural network is supposed to output something differentiable because you're doing like something with partial differential equations and fundamentally what you want to output is something differentiable then you don't want ReLU in there um it's, you're, you'll never quite reach your your goal um and you can also reason about things like if your output should include negatives don't use an activation function that gets rid of them. Um, similarly, if you think through the type of data you have, that can help you choose types of layers. So far, you've only seen fully connected, but next week from Corey, you'll see similar options. And in some way, that's embedding your knowledge of, of your problem. Um, people have also done cool things about adding their domain knowledge as um, part of the loss function. So instead of just minimizing some definition of error, maybe you're adding some more penalties terms. Um, th things like that to kind of guide the training in a direction based on your knowledge of the problem. Um, another reason you might want a differentiable activation function is because we're we're doing calculus and calculating all those gradients and could where you end up in an, an edge case where um, you're right at the non-differentiable point. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, and we'll continue answering questions in Slack. Thank you so much, Bethany. Wonderful. Okay, so. Um, now we're going to sort of switch gears and we have um, a science speaker who's going to come talk about her work. Um, so I'd like to introduce um, Nicola Ferrier. Um, Nicola is a senior computer scientist here at Argonne National Lab. Um, before coming to Argonne, she was actually a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, just up the road. Um, and now some of the work that she's focusing on um, at Argonne is interests in the use of computer vision to control robots, machinery, and devices with applications as diverse as medical systems, manufacturing, and projects that facilitate scientific discovery. Um, today, she's going to talk to us about um, this concept of AI at edge, um, which I think she will explain far better than I will. So I'll hand things over to Nicola and we can start from there. So my name is Nicola Ferrier. I'm a senior computer scientist in the math and computer science division. And we have this project here to support AI at the edge, which is, you know, a whole team of people. And interestingly, we started this project in 2014 before the term edge computing wasn't even ever used. But um, through various rendition, um, <clears throat> uh oh, why isn't my slide advancing? Oh, there we go. Okay, through uh, various versions, we've produced um, <clears throat> this edge computing platform, which we call Waggle. And it is both hardware and software, primarily designed to support running AI at the edge. So we aren't sensor people. Everyone asks what kind of sensors we develop. Um, People call this a sensor network, but really what we're do doing is developing the cyber infrastructure <clears throat> that will help you deploy AI tools to do analysis of sensor data streams that are collected out in the wild in various places. And I'll give some examples of this. The team has various people that work on the software stack, the hardware. Um, I, my focus of my work is on the AI. 
And for the most part, we use standard AI tools to, to build a, what we call a software-defined sensor. <clears throat> so what is a software-defined sensor? It's something that you, know, you can run on a, a, an algorithm to sense something that you can't buy a sensor for. So you can't buy a sensor that tells you whether someone in the rideshare program is wearing a bike helmet. You can't buy a sensor that distinguishes between fixed wing aircraft and drones, but you can run algorithms on your um, data that will allow you to measure all sorts of things that you're interested in. So, <clears throat> and primarily right now, most of the analysis is AI uh, because that's a very powerful tool for working with things like images and audio data LIDAR and uh, other, you know, kind of very expensive sensors. And why do we do this at the edge is because we can do our analysis and only ship back the relevant information rather than these um, very large data streams. <clears throat> so <coughs> um, some examples you can see over here, we have a large number of applications that we've developed uh, mostly as uh, examples for the community so that other scientists can look at our code and our data and, and build their own. And I'm going to describe a few of these here. So <clears throat> Argonne has a project uh, as part of the vehicle technologies work trying to understand uh, and improve traffic flow around Chicago O'Hare Airport as they go are going through a large improvement project. And so there are HPC models that uh, they can run that can analyze various things like the impact on energy based on various policies and decisions about, and maybe some costing. Uh, and what we do is we, we've developed um, a, a system to measure the flow of vehicles, the density of vehicles and other uh, information that they can actually feed into their models. <clears throat> In collaboration with the Berkeley Lab, we're building um, software to find sensors to understand uh, radiation sensors that are deployed in the city. Now, um, the goal is actually to find people that have radiation on them for nefarious reasons, but there are also legitimate places where radiation happens, like medical isotopes and patients near a hospital, or um, actually when a salt truck salts the roads in the winter, it gives a spike in your radiation sensor. Uh, so we're using <clears throat> LIDAR and radiation sensors and cameras to try and understand the context of the, the scent, the, you know, where the radiation measurement came from to improve upon um, the response to detecting radiation in an urban setting. <coughs> <clears throat> There are also models that run, that uh, try to understand hydrology and absorption of water in uh, various, um, what they call retention ponds in the city. And um, we've been working on trying to measure water, uh, standing water on streets. Chicago's prone to flooding after storms. And so this, <clears throat> the models look at, you know, whether there's water, and allow these models to be used to adjust um, the response and you know, perhaps change the, the flow in the sewage system to try and, or the storm sewer system to try and um, avoid flooding in people's houses. And it's also used in, by the park district <clears throat> to restrict access to parks uh, after a, a major rain event to uh, maintain the integrity of the park. <laughs> We've been working with uh, University of California, San Diego, and with the University of Oregon and the Oregon Hazards Lab, trying to do early detection of smoke and fire. And so our original models that are posted all are using uh, regular cameras, trying to distinguish between smoke and um, clouds. But we've also been recently exploring, can you use uh, infrared cameras and will that improve our uh, detection of smoke, because presumably smoke is warmer. Uh, one of the interesting things was last November on our nodes employed on a mountaintop in Oregon, 
you know, there was smoke in the air, which the cameras caught, which you can see in this middle image here. But our infrared cameras, our thermal cameras, actually were picking up where all the hot spots were, um, which are not obvious from the just the color image. So we're doing a lot of work with um, various groups trying to, you know, mitigate uh, the disasters caused in this country by large <clears throat> wildfires. <coughs> So, and then last, uh, the last example, we've worked with Exelon. Now they have um, solar generating facility or solar fields that generate electricity. And what they'd like to do is be responsive. When a huge cloud bank is coming, you can expect a dip in production and you want to be able to, um, to, to be ready for that and proactive rather than reactive. So they have, they would like to know the relationship between cloud cover and solar irradiance. And so um, we built a model that looks at clouds and um, maps it to solar irradiance measures in an attempt to help um, the solar facilities be more responsive. And so here we tried a bunch of different models, which I think you will have seen some of these <clears throat> like fully connected networks and deep lab, and we compare paired their performance on detecting clouds and uh, the relationship to the actual solar irradiance. So now all of these examples I've given are used what's called supervised learning, which I think you've been seeing uh, other uh, cases of. And this requires um, collecting a large set of data. You need manual labels of you know, what is ground truth. Uh, then you need to you know, run and train a model on, on this data. And now that process is extremely tedious. And for scientific applications, there aren't public data sets. So the traffic example I gave was based on the YOLO model, which is a public model. You know, there are models out there that can recognize certain things, but things like solar irradiance measures, there aren't large data sets out there for the public to build models from. And this labeling process is, is very uh, tedious and, and intensive. So we have one project where we're trying to find bees, which are pollinators and then uh, bee recognition. There aren't lot, large public data sets on urban flooding. And so this process is really, really tedious. And so one of the things we've been trying to do is sort out, are there other approaches that you can take to train a network to run at the edge without the need for a large um, data set? So there are many techniques, and I'm just going to present one today that we've looked at, and this is called self-supervised learning. <laughs> now, you've all heard of chat GPT. Some of the tools from self-supervised learning were used to train GPT. And um, you'll find it in all sorts of uh, different things like visual transformers, which is uh, what our work is based on. And uh, various uh, of these large language models use self-supervised learning. So in a nutshell, very briefly here, uh, I'll talk about one. We've, we've looked at a bunch of different techniques, but this is called Dino, which is uh, distillation, no labels. Uh, and what you do is you have two channels in your network. Uh, one is called the teacher and one is called the student. That, that's kind of a bit of a misnomer, but you have two channels and you feed images in this case, or you feed data to both branches of the network and you ask it to give you the same output. But what you do is you, you feed augmentations. So uh, in the case of images, you might rotate, crop, blur, do some minor color adjustments, zoom in or zoom out. So various, um, what we call augmentations of the data are fed to the student, and you're asking it to produce the same output as the teacher. <clears throat> and so what happens is after you've trained this, they become uh, invariant to these augmentations and output the same values for both the student and the teacher. And this output, uh, vector, which is called an embedding vector, captures uh, aspects of the input data. And you can think of it as like a feature vector. 
And we found that by taking those uh, embedding vectors and then doing things like clustering analysis on it, you can group the data into you know, these clusters and then a human can look at the clusters and assign a label. And this is much less tedious than um, labeling all the data. You're really take, uh, just labeling a few clusters afterwards, or you, know, you're, you can use the clusters uh, to relate to solar irradiance in this case. So it works for the cloud, but another example was um, we were looking, we were working with the Morton Arboretum, which is not very far from Ardon, and they were really interested in, you know, this is major highways here near the Arboretum. They were interested in how species um, were impacted by highway noise. And so what we did was we did the same self-supervised learning on spectrograms, which are a visual representation of the audio channel. And then we clustered it. And then what I've done here is projected the clusters back down to 2D. And so the clusters um, are shown as ellipsoids here in two, or ellipses in 2D, but they're really in a higher dimensional space. So they, they overlap in the 2D projection, but they don't overlap in the original uh, embedding space. And each of these clusters actually turns out to be uh, either a specific species of bird or a specific bird song. So we have two clusters here of blue jays, but they're actually fairly distinct calls. Birds have different calls, whether they're a mating call or a warning call. And then we also found clusters that corresponded to things like rain uh, and you know, your ability to do sound uh, in the woods when it's raining is really low on various insects like cicadas. And actually these are two species of cicadas. So we found that self-supervised learning allowed us to explore this large audio data set. And then in the end, um, just looking at these clusters, we were able to assign species to them and other phenomena like rain or, or insects. And so we find this to be a very useful tool to be able to deploy um, a network out at the edge where the scientists, you know, in this case, there actually are large uh, data sets of bird song, which we use to verify our model. But you know, for other apps, other calls, like um, people are interested in bat calls, frog calls, you know, we should be able to perform this sort of self-supervised approach and train a network without having to do this uh, manual, tedious labeling. So AI provides a really powerful tool to analyze the data streams. And by moving the AI out to where you're collecting the data, you can really reduce the bandwidth, especially if you're using audio and video and LIDAR and, <coughs> and uh, these other very um, large data streams. And you pro can provide a measurement of what's the important information. So you don't need to send back a huge data set. You just need to send back the few bytes of data that are relevant, like I heard a cardinal. Um, and so we think that this is a really cool approach to um, deploying AI to help scientists with um, challenging problems out in the field. And I'm sorry, I'm so croaky. Thank you so much, Nicola. So if anybody has any questions, oh, I see one just popped in the chat. Um, Damon asks, um, I know you mentioned you're primarily working on, on the AI side, but can you talk um, more about the hardware used in these software sensors? Is there enough compute power at the edge to power the AI itself? Yes. So right now we're using um, NVIDIA to, um, processors, which are you know AI accelerated. Um, we will be in the next version using the Oren, but we're using, um, we have well, a bunch of, we have, Depending on which incantation, we have a bunch of different NVIDIA tools, but they do, they are powerful enough to do processing of video data, processing of audio data. And some of the hardware we use, which was because of the pandemic, we, you know, we, the manufacturing facility wasn't open to be building these um, hard, the hardware that we were designing. We actually, a bunch of the places we work with, like HP RAN, which is on the mountaintops in California, some of the Oregon facilities and uh, NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network, they have instrument huts and they have racks in there. So we actually just put commodity servers in them and ran our software stack on a commodity Dell blade. 
So, you know, it definitely had the compute power to, to run uh, inference. And actually on those ones, we could even run training up there. Um, so another question that I had as we wait for other questions is, um, what are the sort of the biggest challenges that you face as you do AI at the edge? Um, or maybe small ones as well. Um, so one of the challenges we're, you know, uh, we, we have a couple of them. One of them is we want these to be um, multi-tenant. We want multiple people to be able to use them. And so we've had to do a bunch of work on how do you schedule jobs? How do you run the AI? And so most um, AI, you know, even the, the tools or you, the computers we're using, they just assume you're going to run your network continuously, but we want to swap in and out um, based on what's happening. So um, that's been a challenge to sort of rethink the way you do your AI. So it's not like, a, you know, if you bought a Google TPU, you can run a network on it constantly. But, but if I want to run a network and Paid wants to run a network, I need to swap in and out the model. So that's been an interesting challenge. And actually, there's a social challenge. Um, we've developed this platform with the hopes that the scientists would um, write their AI to solve their problem. And mostly they want us to write the AI to solve their problem. Um, you know, we provide a bunch of examples and people will say, oh, can you do one that does this? And I'm thinking, well, you know, no, that's your job. Um, so there's sort of a social challenge in that, you know, all of the data management, all the cybersecurity, all of the what I would call some of the really tough stuff is all handled, but each person has a different science task. And, you know, we're hoping with all these powerful frameworks that more and more people will um, contribute. Right now we have a couple of users that are contributing, but it's not um, as many as we wanted. Another question from the chat, uh, William asked, when talking about the self-learning method, you mentioned uh, the input data is augmented. Why is this done? Well, so we want two branches to recognize the same thing, regardless of, and you don't have it, you know, you don't know what that thing is. And so if you just feed them the same data, you wouldn't get that. Um, so, you know, the, the network doesn't know what it's looking at. And so if you just feed them the same thing, you're going to get the same output um, from, from both channels automatically because they're the same network. And you know what you want it to do is uh, teach it to recognize, you know, let's say it, you know, go to the standard cats and dogs, but you know, they can be in any position and any, and so you you need the augmentation to to teach it to find something that and be invariant to all those changes in viewpoint and other things. Excellent. Okay, I think one more one more question before we run out of time. Um, Shan asks, have you run into any security or privacy concerns in the current scientific data setting? So um, we designed the system with those in mind. Um, so privacy is an issue. We can't uh, run microphones in the city of Chicago because it has a wiretapping law and any microphone is considered wiretapping. So we can't do any of our audio work in the city. We're very, very careful um, with where cameras are deployed that um, you know we have the data, but we can't share data that might actually have faces and people in it. Uh, more is just, you know, that's perfectly legal to do so, but we don't want to be perceived as violating privacy. But the cybersecurity, the, the devices phone home. There are no open ports, you can't access them. So we've taken a very cautious approach, but from the word go, um, security was one of the main concerns. Excellent, thank you so much. And because they're deployed out weird places, you, know, you can't get to them easily. So you have to take care of security. Definitely. <coughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nicola, um, both for answering the questions and for the presentation itself. Um, I think with that, it's now 430. So thank you all for coming and participating today, and we will see you next week.